Okay, so um, today's lecture uh, is going to be sort of the final introductory lecture. The, the last uh, two classes, um, beyond covering administrative material for this class, um, have really dealt with two types of material. Um, and I'm not gonna cover this chronologically because my normal order of, of featuring them will be different. Um, so we, we saw last time a, um, a, a simple agent-based model. It was descriptively simple. We had people progressing among possible states um, and uh, those states represented health states. But um, their progress along those possible states was governed by transitions and in general, governed by possible actions. And those actions were triggered by rules that could fire to indicate when they went from one state to another. But those individuals were not solitudes. Those individuals are placed in an environment whereby they can interact with other, other agents. And uh, it was through interaction that the really interesting behavior emerged. And I use that word advisedly. Um, we saw when people could communicate with nearby neighbors in a space, even though they were just communicating with the neighbors immediately next to them, the eight neighbors around them, if we consider the grids, the grid squares, um, we could see descriptively complex patterns emerging from a descriptively simple model. We saw waves of infection. We saw recurrence of infection. We saw patterns that were spatial, a spreading wave of infection. And we saw patterns that were aggregated up and seen um, over time as you know, a rise in the number of infectives and a decline. Waves in the number of infectives over time in other cases where we changed the transition. And we saw that the particular assumptions about that model determined, drove that behavior, but in complex ways. We saw that um, if we change parameter assumptions, it would alter behavior in some notable ways. It could, with some values of parameters, make the extension, the, the uh, infection go extinct in some cases. In other cases, it could cause very large waves of infection um, that would leave no susceptibles behind. In other cases, would leave islands of susceptibles behind. And there are many variations on that. We tried with different scenarios. So often we run a model with different scenarios, different what if questions, and we see the results. And often those results surprise us. Even for a descriptively simple model, we're often surprised by the results. And we also saw though, if we altered the structure of that model, if we added a transition back from the recovered state to the susceptible state, it could foundationally alter the behaviors that we see over time, over space, um, in ways that are that, that really change the dynamic fundamentally. It was under those conditions we saw those ongoing waves, those persistent waves of infection for some parameter settings, um, and a chance of reaching some sort of equilibrium for others. We did see this involve stochastics because behavior at an individual level and the interaction of agents with each other and it's almost invariably stochastic. Um, and we saw that illustrated within the model. So that model served as kind of a small toy little model, a thinking model um, that should help us, help us give concrete meaning to certain terms that we've introduced. Um, and and also illustrate, in a particular case, some of the concepts I actually introduced in that final half hour of our very first session, a session which is posted, where I talked about the constituent parts of agent-based models. I talked about agent-based models being defined by one or more populations of individual agents, those agents being characterized by static attributes, which we commonly characterized using parameters, specific assumptions about them, um, about the characteristics of those agents, but also by state. And by, by state, I'm describing situations for each agent which evolve over time. 
Um, and the evolution of that state takes place through certain actions and the actions are governed by rules. And we saw that, that those agents could be put in, in a, a space, an environment by which they can interact with each other and in many models with the environment itself, say polluting the environment or catching a surface contaminated um, pathogen, contaminating pathogen from the environment or being affected by the food environment for my healthy, uh, for my eating choices and, and the balance of healthy or, or less healthy food, et cetera. Um, we also saw with that model that we could ask what if questions with it. We could, we could probe it with different scenarios. And it was taking place over a time horizon with some sort of model of time, which in this case was, was continuous model of time. Um, events happened as quickly or as slowly as needed. Um, so we talked about those constituent components of an agent-based model. Um, it often our interest lies in intervening upon the model and looking at certain outputs, which are also part of that description, it turns out. But, you know, uh, those two lectures in some ways laid the groundwork, the concrete, concrete point of references for today's lecture, which is, it's gonna focus on an issue that I was waffling about whether to include here, because many people here have past exposure to it, but it's become clear some do not. And um, I thought that I could do well to concentrate on the motivations for these models with a particular emphasis for why we use agent-based models as compared to other types of dynamic models, as rich as those are. Um, so today's lecture will actually be about that. And um, for those who have seen a lot of this material before, I can assure you that you will not have seen this particular spin exactly on these materials, because there's new slides, there's new components of it, and little sections um, that I put together for this class specific. So, so let's jump into that uh, if we uh, could here. And um, I'm going to uh, see if we can get through this in a way that will welcome questions as well. And I'd like to invite people to raise your hands or put questions into the chat window, okay? So uh, we're in a new setup here. And so I'm, and, and I have a new version of Zoom. So we're gonna, we're gonna see if everything cooperates here. Uh, can you folks see my slides here? Yes. Okay, uh, the, the, those online can actually see them better. It turns out that those in the room because of a um, difficulty with the uh, resolution here in the room. And this is actually a, a real problem. So I am going to, um, unfortunately, probably going to need to uh, remedy this. Um, we had uh, a setup earlier that looked adequate in terms of coverage for both, but I think this is gonna be an issue. Um, but, uh, Maybe I'll maybe I'll continue and we'll um, we'll bear with it. Um, I can say things that will be occluded. Okay, so um, I think we'll we'll push on. If anyone is in the room here is watching also with your computer, you might want to see the false full screen there, and we'll bear with this. Um, so I think the motivation for this material really lying in and more ever more complex challenges we're facing as a society, um, most coming with an orientation towards health challenges. And these certainly are, um, constitute some of the foremost challenges in the health area. Um, but they're also at the root of challenges in many other spheres that are not limited to health. Often they cross over between health and other spheres, health and criminal justice, for things, uh, health and social services, think things like, um, substance use um, harms or, or factors related to suicide and bullying. These are health issues. They're also social issues. They are also criminal justice issues. But you know, these problems cross over to environmental and ecological concerns, to economic concerns and many other areas. And um, the, the operative term here 
is one that's occluded for the people in the room, which is complex. These are ever more complex problems. And, and these sort of problems are characterized by a situation where the, the behavior of large parts of the system or the system as a whole exhibits really profoundly different behavior than the parts. Um, we can't reduce the behaviors we see at the whole to those parts, to the average or to the sum of those parts. Rather, it transcends that just as much as a traffic jam, the nature of a traffic jam is something more than just the sum of the axle sizes and, and, and uh, engine sizes and car types that, that make it up. There's something, there's a higher level of emergent behavior within these systems. Um, and, and the whole here is surprisingly distinct from, from these pieces. And as a result, it can react surprisingly. If we try to poke it, if we try to turn it for the better, we're often surprised. We're often pushed back against in, in what we call policy, um, in, in, in policy dilution or, or, um, or policies that, that end up having the opposite of their effect, policy resistance. The link between cause and effect is often not so clear and it's often delayed. And so, you know, in effect, an early childhood, childhood uh, exp um, experience that's adverse, we talk about adverse childhood experiences, for example, childhood traumas, can often have effects that are seen, you know, decades later in terms of burden of chronic disease or behavioral issues. And perhaps most critically, it's nonlinear. The effects of interventions in isolation, amongst other things, are very different than um, the effects uh, uh, of, of if you have uh, several interventions and you consider their effects together, it's very different than the sum of those effects uh, independently. And there's many areas where these things occur. One area where we've done a lot of work is emergency department waiting times, where the the effect that we're trying to address to try to lessen the waiting times occurs in the emergency room, but the roots of it lie well outside the emergency room. They extend to the hospital wards and, and the hospital wards being full, so you can't discharge people from the emergency room to there. And the hospital wards are full because you can't discharge patients and you can't discharge patients in part because the community services aren't available and community services aren't available in part because of the high burden and, and, and of those services in dealing with other sorts of conditions. And um, they're also linked to why people come in potentially with unnecessary um, types of, of conditions, conditions that can be seen elsewhere in the community, but are instead come to the emergency room. So uh, within this context, there's these systemic um, problems that manifest in the emergency room. Um, and there's many feedbacks associated with this. Lock-ins that can occur where you lock into a firefighting mode and, and you end up going and the, the cartoon is elided in, the, in the, the in person version here, but you end up going around uh, in circles. It's not so much that money, too little money is being devoted to the problem. It's, it's not being devoted in a fashion that is, a, is, is suitably balanced and, and, and given that it will solve the problem. Instead, it disproportionately um, goes to areas which are not the bottlenecks, for example. Another example is the opioid epidemic, which again, manifests pervasively, right? It's, it's, it may be seen most directly in terms of overdoses in the emergency room or in people's homes, but it's not about those homes. It's not about what's going on in the emergency department alone. It's about what's going on in chronic pain management way upstream, much earlier. It's about adverse childhood experiences and childhood traumas. It's about the, the factors having to do with, with the availability of treatment programs and the fact that many have very long waiting times for people who, who are relying on, on um, the, the public health system to support their access, et cetera. So again, it's, it's got these features of a complex system that what goes on over here comes from many different places. It's pervasive, it's coupled. And it also has these other features of feedbacks and path dependence and lock-in and delayed effects of, of interventions and systemic imbalance. And we can put up antimicrobial resistance in the same way. The antimicrobial resistance we see over in hospitals or in long-term care facilities 
is not foundationally just a problem there. It comes from other quarters, including quarters in farms, um, including uh, issues that are, uh, that are occurring in animal husbandry and in even wild animal populations in some cases for, for certain, certain diseases. So here we again have this pervasiveness, um, these features of feedback properties, uh, path dependent lock-in effects, which um, make it dauntingly hard to manage. You try to intervene here, it ends up popping out over there. You try to fix this thing, it shifts the bottleneck. And we're left in, in, in a very challenging situation. And I'll, I'll note the food system is equally much so. If we aim to, to try to improve access to healthy foods in, for example, underserved neighborhoods, um, sometimes we find ourselves getting into food distribution issues and refrigeration and availability of infrastructure and consumer taste and competition and ability to transport foods outside the winter on ice roads, et cetera. And there's a set of, of challenging issues. And you know, some of my colleagues uh, like Sandra Galea, uh, Dean at, at BU have, have sort of diagrammed out you know, elements of the food system and, and emphasizing its um, intricate nature and its um, the coupling between different areas of it. And this gives rise to complex behavior. But remember from that last lecture, that complex, complex behavior, behavior where we get emergent patterns where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts is not limited to descriptively complex systems. It can result from it and typically does, but it, it can result from very descriptively simple problems. You can get this pervasive complex behavior complex in manifesting in patterns over space, over time, over networks, et cetera. Um, but when we do have very complex systems like this that are interlinked and so on, it, it almost assures significant complexity in many areas of it. And the need is even is emphasized further. Um, many in health have, have spoken and, and my colleague, George, uh, George Kaplan, was an early proponent of the socio-ecological model in, in, in health. And here we're going beyond sort of just envisioning the system as a whole, but thinking about effects on particular people, particular individuals, the things that affect their behavior, their knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, for example, um, uh, their decision-making as coming from a broader set of contexts. Um, from relationships that they have with others, from organizations in the community and, and with which they, they uh, may be served, by which they may be served, et cetera, the communities that, that include them and you know, policy and broader society and social norms, stigmas, et cetera. Um, and if we think about this and we think about what things influence particular individuals, we may know a lot about pieces of individual behavior, but to really understand why it comes about, we need to understand areas of context. We need to understand the broader context that bears on that individual. Um, and as Maurice notes, uh, marketing it, it is, a, is a huge factor and a huge factor in, in quite a few of these areas. Um, uh, you know, in the area of social determinants of health, some may be familiar um, with the primacy of that concept um, sometimes this is approached, in my view, a little bit too simplistically in a static way, but we have to recognize that an individual's situation, their health situation, for example, their heart, heart health, um, is affected by, by layers of context that are affected by other things. And in return, and it's very important to note for a dynamic perspective, for example, their employment prospects and their income. Um, or their social exclusion is itself also partly a reflection of their health, whether they can attain certain types of employments is a reflection of their health. Um, where they can work um, uh, to the degree to which they're welcomed um, in certain quarters of society, uh, where they can live. There are often reciprocal relationships here that are, are really important. Exercise affects weight, but weight affects um, weight affects a person's ability to exercise in certain ways. So within these systems, you know, 
which are not just common, but ubiquitously involved in the hardest problems we have to solve, including you know, taming the, the fearsome adversary of COVID-19, um, we're often stuck like blind men in the elephant, you know, groping around a bigger system, each of whose pieces is understood by different quarters of people um, and who are each convinced about the importance of that component. But we need something more than a system that will take apart these problems into pieces in isolation. We need something that will help us understand the elephant that's rampaging um, most generally. And, and this need comes out in really two big ways. First, we want to explain what we see in the world, you know, and, and why do we see this? What is it telling us? What, is it, what does it imply about, for example, um, how certain factors are working? Does the evidence we see support my hypothesis about how things work in the world? Where is it likely to go next? Critical, of course, in, in COVID-19. Um, you know, what's driving the observed patterns is what I'm seeing, you know, a, a good or bad thing even is sometimes not obvious. You find more cases of COVID-19 in a, in a brief time. Is that a terrible thing? It indicates an outbreak and a, you know, a, a crisis of un- um, of unidentified um, uh, infection, or is it a good thing because you're actually finding people who are sick who are otherwise weren't known about, you're bringing them for testing and you're having them undergo isolation to isolate themselves from others. So when we're dealing with these complex systems, we often have dynamic complexity. And, and what's shown here for those in the room is, uh, and some will probably see it online there, is, is a um, classic infection curve. Uh, some people here last time described it looked like a bit like a normal distribution. It's classic rise of infection, then a decay according to recovery rates on the right-hand side. Um, often it's not symmetric. Um, but this was recorded in the 1700s by an observer, um, uh, Braley, of the bubonic plague in London. This, this type of graph, this sort of rise and fall, which we'll draw on the board for those. Um, oh, <laughs> that's not going to help much. Um, uh, I'll draw on the board. It looks something like like this and, and a decay there. Um, that sort of pattern um, is, uh, is you know, broadly indicative of the sort of emergent patterns we see with complex systems. We see all the time these systems that we're trying to turn for the better. We're trying to improve this situation, characterized by, by these distinctive types of behavior. This is one. Um, this from uh, New York City in the COVID-19 epidemic showing rise in the number of, of hospitalized individuals in yellow, um, uh, changes in, in new positivity per 100,000, in um, uh, per 100,000 tests in the orange here, uh, rises in the, um, uh, the number of new cases in brown, which is not visible in, in person, et cetera, and number of tests uh, shown here in, in gray. Um, uh, now, um, the realization, of course, here is that these are not solitudes. Each of these curves tells a story, but it's an interconnected story. It's a connected, interconnected story about the same underlying system. And uh, early on in infectious diseases, researchers recognized, um, you know, the, the very characteristic patterns that come up, not just that classic infection um, curve that comes up with epi curves on the rise and fall for an SIR type situation, but these sort of semi-periodic oscillations that occur for measles, mumps, chickenpox, and many other infections in the pre-vaccination era. And I've shown them here from a bunch of different jurisdictions, England, Wales, England, Wales Saskatchewan, et cetera. Um, but you know, patterns over time are just one piece of these complex, rich patterns we see. Um, they're in a very important one. They have to do with behavior over time in a central way. But we also see patterns over space and spatio-temporal pattern, patterns over, over space and time that beg for explanation. Here for 
patterns of chlamydia uh, within the Winnipeg area from, from uh, my colleague, um, uh, Ann Jolly and, and John Wiley and others, or spatial spread for rabies, where you get these kind of concentric rings of patterns of, of, of rabies cases that spread out as rabies spreads to nearby areas. These types of waves, you can't see it for those in the room, but these sorts of waves and, and sort of concentric rings are very real effects. And we see it with chronic disease with things like the spread of, of, of obesity over networks. Um, these are not limited to, to infectious diseases. We see it with transmission of knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, um, innovations, um, uh, mental health distress, as Maurice knows, et cetera. Um, uh, with with uh, and obesity is one, and this is from a Framingham Heart study um, looking at obesity within a social network and finding that there's a seeming contagion effect associated with it. Some might be uh, might be explained associationally that people of similar weights hang around because they have similar similar types of uh, lifestyle, et cetera. But but some of it is likely imitative behavior as well. Um, and we see it in things like caregiver well-being and child well-being, for example, where you know a, a caregiver can can be depressed and the child's at risk of early early distress, mental health issues, um, or where where both are are in a in a healthy situation. So what, when we're dealing with these things, and um, uh, we're we're um, we're dealing with challenges which uh, involve a complex system trying to interpret these patterns, trying to interpret where they're coming from. We're dealt a real um, quandary because we're dealing with the descriptively complex uh, or, or a uh, could be descriptively complex. Sometimes it's a descriptively simple problem, but with complex behavior. And we're trying to understand to what degree does our understanding of what's going on there in the world really align with empirical evidence. We're trying to understand what is that curve telling me? Does it agree with my basic model that, you know, there's a long latent period for this infection, that there's a long period people are infected but not yet infectious, for example. And if we're reasoning about this only in our head, we, we often have a really hard time. In fact, it's devilishly hard. Um, to the point that almost nobody can realistically accomplish it purely in their head to, to analyze these patterns and, and really tease out firm understanding of whether they're consistent with a certain theory. But where these challenges are the most acute is when we need to intervene. And I don't care if it's a system of behavior of a server farm in computer science, or a complex um, series of network machines, or the spread of computer viruses, or the spread of, of biological viruses. If you're trying to improve things for the better in health, in, in whatever area, or in many diverse other domains, there's a real quandary of how do we best improve the situation? How do we move towards optimality? Um, where do we intervene in the system? how to intervene, how soon will we see effects, how soon will we scale up. These effects are, are writ large in the food system where we have these dizzying number of places where you know, we could intervene um, uh, to, to try to improve um, uh, people's, that, the healthiness of people's diet. Um, and, and I've listed you know, a couple dozen of them, dozen of them here, for example. Um, uh, same thing with opioids, right? In, in, to what degree will we be helped by creation of an integrated chronic pain clinic, for example, or promotion of alternative pain management strategies or expanded treatment programs for those in corrections or those you know, temporarily detained by police or stricter prescribing standards and, and enforcement, finding people sooner who might be abusing drugs? So do we need added police resources to identify and shut down dealers of, of fentanyl and, and the most dangerous drugs? Um, uh, should we, should we you know, legalize drugs across the, the board or decriminalize them? Um, should we try to improve compliance for monitoring the prescription monitoring programs or, 
or uh, invest in tamper-proof designs for for dispensers of of uh, of opioids, for example. Um, these are all different choices, and you know we with these complex systems, it's really challenging to try to decide which of them are worth our efforts. We have limited time, we have limited uh, understanding and limited uh, resources, and we wanna turn things for the better. Here we have two quandaries. The first is just understanding what's going on out there and if it's consistent with our theory. And then we're laying on top of that interventions. We're laying on top of that attempts to change the situation. And again, trying to go through this exercise in our head about the degree to which certain interventions will yield desired outcomes, even individually, much less in concert, is really extraordinarily challenging. Um, and uh, the consequences of these challenges are writ large. We have misperceptions. We have unanticipated responses to our intervention and policy resistance, cases where our policy is, response is diluted or defeated or actually worsens the situation. Um, we have problems learning from experience, coordinating, planning a system, designing an effective and equitable system. And we end up going around in circles as a health system and in more broadly in our services often investing effort into things that are working against the nature of things like King Canoe trying to order back the tide. Um, you know, we're trying to work against the nature of things is not an effective way to use our energy and time. We, we want to work in a way that will be high leverage. Uh, you're muted, I think. Still muted. Okay. Uh, oh. Well, this is certainly exciting. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm going to engage in remedial behavior. I'm going to log out with this phone and I'm going to rely on someone else to, to, to notify me when the chat occurs. Okay, can you folks hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Anyone put a thumbs up or something to indicate you've heard me? Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Okay, so like King Canute, um, you know, we risk, if, if we're not operating in a grounded way on an understanding of the ways in which the pieces of a system work together, we're doomed to not understand why we see the patterns that we are, but that we do, but and, and we'll be misinterpreting them. But even more foundationally, we'll be putting our efforts into courses of action that are doomed to fail, that are bound to be limited in their effect compared to what we could achieve. Um, now, um, the critique of system science is that you know traditional science. Um, uh, has been extremely effective in many areas, but is limited in a certain quarter, which is um, uh, the reductionist view that we can understand things best by taking them apart into their pieces. And, and uh, as a result of, of doing that, um, that will somehow gain knowledge needed to manage or direct or, or uh, improve the situation with, a, with the system. We take things apart. And this, this is um, the standard route um, has been for centuries. 
for understanding everything from how a watch works to, you know, understanding how biology operates within organisms. Until recently, um, we've relied on this system of, of taking things apart. And in health, and in traditional health sciences, um, almost all statistical work falls into this, or a very large fraction. We, we identify, we say, okay, the associations um, uh, of interest um, uh, to, that, that might be driving variability in the outcomes or such and such, and we study how much of the variability in an outcome might be, might be parceled out into variability in its different pieces. We, we take apart the, um, uh, the variability in the, in the outcome into a simple sum of variability in pieces in a way that is very reductive. Um, and this strategy has offered enormous insights and it has strong benefit. It's not that it's fundamentally flawed, but it has its limits. And the limits are limits that come into play with these complex systems. Um, it's in the context of complex systems, we need something more than that. Just like when you're building a house, you need something more than the trade specialist for the roof or for the plumbing or for the electrical. Um, you, need, you need a generalist. You need someone who will put the pieces together into a whole. And um, uh, in, in this case, um, that generalist is system science. It's a science of a whole. And it, it's really designed to not to secure knowledge, not just by taking things apart. It draws on insights from that, from elsewhere in science, of course. But it really focuses on putting things together. It focuses on understanding how the behavior of the system as a whole is more than just its parts, just as the behavior of that model we saw last time um, with those waves and so on, it's, it's not simply the sum up of the behaviors of people transitioning from state to state and the behavior associated with, you know, people sending messages to each other, et cetera. It's, it's something more than that, just like a traffic jam is more than the sum of the cars in it. Um, system science can help us visualize, understand, reason about the implications uh, regarding processes in the world that can help us test consistency with evidence. And really a, a central way where system science achieves this is through dynamic models. Um, and these models help us represent how things might work or how things could work in a way that they serve as thinking tools and, and labs for refining our thinking and for sharing our assumptions with others and, and inviting critique. And so some hallmarks of complex systems that recommend this are listed here. And um, these include some things off the screen for not for those in the room, emergence, uh, effects at different scales, which are different, um, uh, adaptation and learning, interagent effects, as well as many, many that, that are in here. So um, over the past uh, half century, particularly, um, researchers in this area of complexity or complex systems or system science have recognized the really important um, conceptual role that complex systems play. They are something different. There's something more there. Um, just like information, uh, the concept of information is more than just the wires on which it's transmitted or the, the pieces of paper on which you know, information is written down. It transcends that. So what is with complex systems? They're, they're more than the pieces. And models, it turns out, the models we're learning about in this course, the agent-based models, um, uh, are arguably the most important tool in system science. They're certainly the most prominent tool in widespread use. Um, and they can be viewed as capturing dynamic hypotheses, hypotheses about behaviors of systems, where here with agent-based models, we're talking behaviors not only over time, but over space, over geography, over networks, et cetera. Um, and uh, these models depict interaction of many different pieces where the whole is not simply the sum of those pieces. It's, it's the interconnection between them and the behaviors that, to which they give rise that emerge from them. And um, uh, key need for these is to, is to understand counterfactuals, what if scenarios that have not been directly observed. 
if this were to change or if that were to change. And models typically, therefore, include a representation of causal structure. Um, there are dynamic models that are not causal, but generally in a practical vein, we're often interested in, in changing things for the better and, and understanding in a different context, how would things be different? We need a, a model that, it, that captures positive causal connections that where what's represented the model is, is our best guess at what's, what the causal relationships are relating factors we see in the world. And often these start in semi-qualitative form and then move to, to, to quantitative characterization. And this is true for agent-based models as well. Um, so um, these sort of simulation models have many, many different uses. And some of my colleagues in the health sciences and in modeling have documented dozens. Uh, Don Burke, uh, formerly at Pitt, now head of epistemics, and, um, and Josh Epstein, I think have lists of dozens of uses of models. Um, one of the most common ones is serving as a what if tool, evaluating, benef uh, evaluating benefits of restructuring a system, understanding patterns we see by the world, interpreting what is this really telling us about things in the world, helping us prioritize data collection, understanding general rules about when certain interventions work and, and serving as communication. And um, dynamic models, really work together with traditional tools. Um, they allow us to learn more quickly from data, to interpret that data more deeply, more reliably, and more quickly. Um, and, uh, and they often leverage uh, traditional tools in this. Now, the analogy I want to give for everyone in this class, it's, it's really important to understand this because it will come to the fore in our next lecture about ABM conceptualization is the, the analogy between models and maps. When we're dealing with a system, characterizing a system in the world, we might informally describe it that way. You know, I wanna build a model of gonorrhea in Saskatoon or something like that. But the truth is that just as there's no one map of Saskatoon, there's no one model of gonorrhea in Saskatoon that's sort of the correct model. Um, uh, we use different maps for different purposes. So if I want to bike across Saskatoon, I'll use a different map than if I want to drive across Saskatoon, a different map than if I want to walk or if I want to take transit from here to the airport. I use different maps. Their maps are specific to purpose. And the reason that they're so specific, a large part of that reason is they leave out details that are irrelevant for that purpose, right? If, if I wanna take a bus to South Kaduna, I don't have to know where every bike path is. Uh, if I wanna to drive to Saskatoon, I also don't need to know the details of the bike network. Um, and I don't need to know the details of the bus routes. Um, so models are useful just like maps by leaving out details. If, if we didn't leave out details with maps, we'd never be able to fit them on a phone, much less you know, in a glove compartment of a car um, in a physical form. Um, uh, it's precisely because they leave out detail, they're useful. Um, but it also means that they are purpose specific. And for modeling, in general, dynamic modeling, this is important. For agent-based modeling, this is absolutely central because it is very easy to layer things into agent-based models in more and more detail because they are so incredibly flexible. They're just, uh, in, in, they're just uh, wonderfully versatile tools, but um, their versatility, their flexibility becomes a danger if we don't use purpose as a logical knife to cut away unnecessary complexity, as John Sturman likes to say. Um, now, you know, some have, have argued, George Box says, all models are wrong, some are useful. I think that's, you know, a useful aphorism. Um, uh, in the same sense, all, all maps are wrong, but some are useful for certain purposes. Um, the key is models like maps have to be purpose specific. What we put into a model, what we leave out of a model, what we characterize as fixed, what we characterize as variable, will depend on model purpose, okay? Um, 
So I'm going to finish this lecture by commenting. And I'd, I'd ask those physically in the class if someone could be monitoring the chat and let me know if there's a message posted. I'd, I'd appreciate it um, because I'm not able to, to monitor it now after that adverse uh, feedback effect. Um, I'd like to, to leave you with some thoughts about motivations for modeling here. Um, and there's some new ones in here, which others may not have seen, ones that I, I thought were worth really bringing to the fore. Um, uh, so why dynamic the model? Why, why do I dynamic the model? One is to learn more effectively about the world. Um, and part of this is to make my assumptions shared and explicit so they can be critiqued because learning about the world is a collective effort. And we, build, we learn about the world most effectively if we stand on the shoulders of giants. And part of that is making our assumptions explicit enough that others can understand them build on them themselves or critique them, help refine them, help challenge them. Models are, are not um, so much uh, attempts to capture the truth, but to advance ourselves towards the truth more quickly. Um, and often we start with, with model maps that are not full models themselves. They're not runnable, but they depict the essential structure in ways that are semi-quantitative. And I, I give an example here involving substance use and health, for example, and poverty, um, which, is, which is shown here using a language called causal loop diagrams. And I don't have time to go into here. This is very common in, um, in system dynamics, and you'll find me giving lectures about this. It's also very useful in agent-based modeling for, for diagramming out, oh, oh no, that's really interesting. Um, we are getting all sorts of exciting um, dynamics here. So it says it can't show this in, okay, this is even more exciting. Um, uh, this, uh, this is a comparable language that we created for agent-based modeling, um, which, which drew on some ideas from causal diagrams, but, um, uh, but did adapted them to agent-based modeling. By the way, if people are, are interested in this sort of material and you are thinking about finding course projects, um, you know, finding uh, additional refined languages for, for diagramming um, structure um, in a free uh, precise fashion, a fashion that's not fully precise enough to simulate yet is, in other words, to engage in model mapping is a fine idea in, in um, uh, the agent-based modeling area. So we have, a, we have a, a hierarchical language for characterizing agent dynamics, which uses stock and flow diagrams, um, causal loop diagrams, state charts, and other tools. And it does so actually in a collaborative way. So this was built up in my lab some years ago. I, Wade has seen it. Um, I don't think anyone else has here, but it's designed to, to allow you to sketch out you know, what you're thinking on what key components we wanna capture in an agent-based model um, in a way that um, proceeds creating the, the, the model itself. Um, another way to do that that we've experimented with is um, with, um, uh, with uh, using paper and little stickies um, to, to use state charts, for example. Um, so here uh, related to gestational diabetes, for example, um, uh, in, with Australia colleagues. Um, uh, here we are, um, okay, this is, is really perverse because this is really getting only a tiny fraction of this in Zoom. Um, uh, here we're, we're doing it, uh, so Australian colleagues were doing this for, um, for alcohol use. Um, and this was a, a glimpse from one of the uh, sessions with gestational diabetes there um, with uh, stakeholders from the health system um, and, and, and others, um, academics, uh, uh, you know, shaping and understanding of, of some of the factors involved with gestational diabetes. Uh, here's yet another, Another case, um, 
uh, for COVID-19, uh, sort of mapping out system structure. And in general, the tool that we're going to be using this semester is pretty good for making explicit our understanding of um, uh, of, of system um, system structure at a qualitative level before proceeding to full quantitative uh, specification. Um, another reason I model uh, is to make my assumptions precise and testable. So what we've been looking at is is models. Um, it's, it's models of a phenomenon. Um, by putting those out there, by putting them in the clear light of day um, and sharing them with others, what I get is critique on these. By showing these to people, people can see them, can react to them, can challenge them, can make suggestions, and can help improve them. And that's how science advances. It's by taking ideas out of our head putting them into a form that others can comment on and help advance and thereby help correct our misunderstandings. And often until you put something down in this way, there's tacit knowledge people have that won't be brought to the fore yet. It'll be, it'll be merely tacit, but it's when you put it out there in front of them, that's often when um, understanding um, uh, is elicited from them, comments are elicited, um, suggestions. But there's something more than that we do with models. We do a lot more than just illustrating our ideas. If that's all models were, they'd be bringing a lot to the world. But models are simulation models. They allow us to take our assumptions, to characterize them in a precise enough way we can simulate them. And this raises all sorts of extra opportunities for learning and for critique. Um, by making it simulatable, we get behavior out in ways that um, often um, cross-check our thinking, improve us, uh, you know, help, help improve our thinking, and that allow other people to critique even more deeply. Um, and you know, I'd like to challenge the all too common um, idea here that models are like crystal balls. Um, uh, this idea that models, you know, serve to predict the future, and they're either good crystal balls or they're worthless crystal balls. Um, but um, you know, good model is one that just predicts uh, the future. That's all too common a notion in in pop culture, um, and it's a deep dis. It does deep disservice to to really what we gain from models. Um, and I like to analogize models instead to uh, a prosthesis, um, a prosthesis um, where we're not dealing, so a prosthesis is something like a cane, a crutch, or an artificial leg, a, a, a boot um, in, in a medical sense, which allows us to achieve nearly full functionality despite our physical limitations, right? We break our leg, we have a crutch, and we get around with a crutch, and we can catch the bus, and we can get into class. Or we um, we're, we're, you know, uh, at risk of, of um, tripping or, 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 uh, or missteps, and we have a cane that supports us. And we can achieve nearly full function because of this prosthesis. I'm sort of referring here thus far to physical prostheses, crutches, canes, boots, you know, uh, artificial legs. But what models are, are in fact, mental processes or cognitive processes. They're tools for helping us think through the consequences of our, of our theory more deeply and, and, and more reliably. And, and they do that in large part because we can see the consequences of our theory over time, or over space, or over age groups, et cetera. Um, this was from a, a work done by Wade um, on pertussis modeling. Um, uh, and uh, here, you know, we're comparing model outcomes with with what's actually observed empirically for the same for the same jurisdictions. This is with Alex Doroshenko, Karsten Hempel, Wade. Uh, um, we can look at mean incidents. We can look at cumulative density and yearly incidents. Um, uh, we can look at um, uh, the the risk ratio since last vaccine doses for individuals. 
Um, we can look at age-based distribution of incidents. In short, by running a model, we can compare it against all these different outcomes that will tell us, you know, is this a reasonable theory? Unless we run it, unless we can compare the emergent behavior of that model against what's observed from the world, it's hard for us to know, is this a reasonable model? Because it's not obvious what its behavior is in our head. It's by running it that we, we often see, oh, this model is out to lunch. It's totally off base. Or it's got this strength, it's got this basically right, and these other things are off base. Often, it's at that point that stakeholders come forward too and say, you know, that looks reasonable to me, or I haven't seen that in a long time, or, or you know, um, th that looks totally wild, like it's 10 times larger spikes than I've ever seen or what have you. It's, it's by running it that it elicits more understanding, more critique, more knowledge that comes for, for, from stakeholders that help us improve our model. In short, because our model can be run, produce behavior that we can compare with data from the world or people's lived experience from the world, from operating in the world, it's that fact that often allows us to cross-check model assumptions, challenge model assumptions and improve the model. Um, so, you know, here models are thinking processes. They, they help us learn more quickly. Um, more deeply, more reliably, more robustly um, by thinking through the implications of our assumptions. Um, if, if we don't have them, it's not clear if our assumptions are consistent with what we see in the world. Because we have simulation models, we can say, I'm gonna describe these assumptions, these dynamic hypotheses in a model, run the consequences and compare it in the clear light of day against what we see from the world. And that allows us to more quickly cross-check our understanding. So it's not that the model is right, it's the model speeds us, it's not the model encapsulates truth like a crystal ball, it speeds us towards truth, it helps us learn more quickly. Um, it helps us fail early and fail often. Um, so instead of relying on informal reasoning um, that links up our theory of what's in the world to observe data and you know we, we try to interpret does that data support our theory in our head, we can instead use a model to, to test that, to say, does this theory produce results when we run the model that are similar to what's observed from the world or to what people who are experts from the world, who, who are stakeholders or people with lived experience in the world um, have observed. Um, and the idea is, you know, very simple. It's better to be transiently wrong than perpetually confused. So um, Francis Bacon said uh, in the 1600s, you know, truth sooner, sooner comes out of error than from confusion. And that can sound perverse. How could it, how could truth come from error faster than just a skeptical, you know, leaning back and saying, I don't know what to think. The idea is fail early, fail often, try something you know, take some stance, evaluate it critically, see if it matches up, if it doesn't improve it. You've, you've learned forward, you fail forward, right? Um, it's fail early, fail often, and it's in the 1600s. Um, uh, and, and, and as such, it, it helps us evolve our grounded understanding of what's going on. The model is not truth. It but it helps us more quickly move towards truth by telling us when our thinking is off base. It takes our cherished theory and puts it out there and says, nah, it just doesn't cut it in these regards. You have to go back and fix it, you know, with respect to how it yields these behaviors. And that, that really gives us guidance in a way that otherwise is lacking from just looking at data from the world or from reasoning in our head. Um, you know, another reason we model though is the fact is all of us make decisions in life based on mental models. We all have models in our heads. We all have some understanding of how things work in the world and we're trying to grapple our way through the world based on that. Um, and uh, by, putting things into a, 
a formal model, a computational model, an agent-based model, we can consciously challenge these mental models. We can consciously work to, to, to evolve them. And so the idea here is we have a, a learning cycle. We have a model in our head. We have a formal model down here that captures that mental model. We test it by running it. And we say, does that line up with what we see from the world? If it doesn't, we refine our mental model. We refine our, our computational model. We go back and forth. We're, we're refining our thinking about how things work in the world. And then where possible, we collect more information about the world to cross-check other aspects of the model, or we take actions in the world, we see the consequences, and we further test the model. This is not a relying on a crystal ball to tell us where things are going. This is improving our understanding of the world over time by finding where our cherished ideas just don't add up and, and, and refining them accordingly in, in, um, in an honest way. Um, uh, yet another reason we model is to best leverage data on, on what's going on in the world. Uh, we saw this earlier with, with sort of a model that lines up with diverse types of data or, or the model that, um, that lines up here with a, um, uh, an age specific contact matrix, for example, which produces patterns from the model generated by the model. In this case, a model which represents schools and households, et cetera, um, uh, homes uh, uh, that, that basically produces a, a mixing matrix that's quite similar to some empirical data sources. Um, now, once you secure conviction in the model, we can seek to use it to assess um, intervention effects. And, and here the idea is that we are using the model as the tool for helping us link up our theory, our interventions, and our outcomes. If we do this in our head, we're doomed to, to have only very poor understanding of how interventions will affect the situation. We're groping in the dark. Um, but with a model, we can perform this linkage more reliably. Um, it's not that our model is perfect, but it will be so much better in capturing the effects of interventions that are ahead that it's probably the least bad of the alternatives, a point to which I'll come back. Um, so for example, we might look at outcomes uh, for you know, vaccine effectiveness as predicted by a model for maternal immunization for pertussis. This from work with, with the, the work with Wade and, and Alex Doroshenko and, and Karsten. Um, or we might say, you know, what's the impact of eliminating crowding disparity in terms of spread of infection from our agent-based model? Now, it's worth noting that models, and probably worth emphasizing, that models come with different levels of, of uses in this regard for which they can be reliably put. Um, so, you know, uh, it's much easier with when you're looking at what if interventions, you're, you're evaluating these interventions you've never seen before, to ask, for example, which of them will yield results quickest, or and maybe which will yield the largest type of effect. Um, uh, where to intervene on the system seems to yield the highest leverage. Those are somewhat easier questions. Um, uh, as you move down this list, it becomes harder and harder. Um, you know, is intervention A going to yield more better results than intervention B? Um, you know, that takes more accuracy. Um, is it going to be slightly better or a lot better? Um, um, that also requires, um, you know, some increasing confidence about the model as represented. Um, uh, and, you know, go, getting down to, you know, the things that are often not possible, given an intervention, what values are, 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 are really going to result day to day or most likely to day to day. That requires a lot, a lot of, of um, a lot of evidence and confidence in a model to buttress it. So, you know, if you're working with models, you can get a lot out of high level understanding 
without a lot of sureness of, of the exact particulars of model structure. You can get a lot of principles out. And early on in the pandemic, just at the time that I was seconded to the health system, um, we have very, very simple models of COVID-19 that taught broad points of understanding to the policymakers, that taught them to our, to our uh, deputy ministers of health, ministers of health folks on the health authority. Um, you know, general principles, I'm referring to your things like, in, look, if you intervene earlier, it will actually, it will slow down the spread of the outbreak peak for the, for the first wave of, of outbreak. Um, um, you know, that if you, if you um, prevent immigration, uh, you shut down the borders, that will buy you time, but it won't help reduce the size of the outbreak that results. It, it will reduce, it will push it off to later, but it won't fundamentally help reduce the size of it. Um, uh, you know, it can, it can help teach you lessons about to what degree a given intervention this from some of Wade's work early on, um, uh, will, for example, lower um, the size of outbreaks, um, not so much the possible size, but the, um, um, the sort of uh, average or median, median size of them in these cases. And generally with agent-based models, we're looking at ensembles of realization. So we're looking at running it many, many times and seeing, um, uh, seeing the statistical patterns that come up, in this case, for baseline without intervention or with intervention, you'll notice that intervention, for example, has brought down the size here, but it's also concentrated the median at a much lower value than the median here. It is possible, however, that it will yield some, some equally, equally high. And these are more sort of um, envelopes of possibilities. I anticipate often to, to see what's coming. This um, from uh, Shingles, uh, other work with uh, Ellen Rafferty and uh, and Wade and um, uh, and, and uh, perhaps one more colleague as well with with uh, Shingles cases, anticipating what might be coming up um, with the baseline situation versus an intervention for one particular realization. And this with um, some models with, with uh, machine learning as well. Um, but two other points about why a model, because models tell stories. Um, when, when I started modeling uh, seriously for reach of purposes and societal issues in 1990, um, I didn't really give a lot of thought to storytelling. And when I first um, encountered this idea of models as storytelling tools, I thought it was a bit fluffy. Um, it, it, was, it was kind of a nice idea. It sounded warm and fuzzy, but it, I really didn't think it, it, it was um, you know, that, that valuable to, to really emphasize in the context of real world decision making. Um, but it turns out, you know, uh, as I've grown older and as I've learned more about the human theater of making decisions, and about um, getting people to help critique a model, help advance a model, the teams that make good modeling possible. The role of storytelling has been really emphasized as important in my head. Um, stories play a really key psychological role within a person, between people, and societally. It, it's hard to find something more important than the stories we tell that change people's thinking, that motivate them, that help shape their action. Whether you wish it were this way or not, and the more quantitative side of me often wishes it weren't so simplistic, it, it really is true that stories, stories have this incredible power. And uh, dynamic models in general tell powerful stories. They tell narrative, they give narratives, they, they, they um, help us understand narratives that are psychologically very powerful. And it's in our interest um, to work with the nature of things, the fact that people are convinced and, and often uh, open up their expertise in response to, to stories. And the point here for this class 
is a particular pointed one because individual level models tell unusually rich stories. Agent-based models tell stories that are especially powerful, compelling, um, to which people can relate. And there's several reasons for this. Number one, and perhaps most importantly, stories are in an individual level. They are stories at the level of an agent, for example, that can be told by these models. The models allow stories at all different levels, the agent-based models. You can aggregate up and tell a story collectively, but the fact that they allow stories at an individual level has something very psychologically compelling because we are agents as well. We are actors as well. And we can see our stories sometimes writ large in the stories of, of others or, or relate to the others. It can tell us relational stories, stories about the relationship between two parties, for example, or stories over geography, space, and networks that are very compelling besides the classic stories over time that are told by all the models, um, the collective stories. Um, uh, and employing, in, employing storytelling in modeling explicitly, like being conscious about our models as storytelling vehicles can really aid helping us get people to share their experiences with the model, share their stories, their understanding, their barriers, um, uh, their narratives in, in ways that are often very insightful and can also, and this is absolutely key, there is nothing, so in my time with the health system, year to year and a half with regular meetings with our chief medical officer at least once a week, uh, you know, discussing those who, who uh, were foundational in making sure that understanding was provided that would help shape policy, there was nothing more compelling than a compelling story. And if you could take your model results and tell a, a coherent, briefly summarized story out of it, that's what would often shift people's understanding. That would shift their thinking about this situation. It's stories. It's stories. It's stories. Um, now, models of this sort, as I say, can tell collective stories, account of people treated, or people leaving without being seen from the, the health system, or, or a number of people who are infectious over time or susceptible. But uh, this, this, again, from work with, uh, with Wade, um, for individual level storytelling. And I think Larissa has, has adopted it or some of her modeling. Um, but, you know, uh, allowing an interface whereby you can query the personal experiences of agents in the model, their narrative, what, what went on for them, you know, when they were exposed to an infectious agent, for example, when they contracted a waterborne illness, for example, over here, or when they were, um, when they left the nursing station after, after being treated for this waterborne illness. Um, but finally, um, why do I model in the end? because it's the least bad of the alternatives. I don't know of anything else that approaches it in terms of helping us head off this, this risk of policy resistance, helping us head off banging our head against the wall of, of um, working against the nature of things and, and interpreting data according to cherished prejudices when the actual reality is, is much different. So a few take home messages from this lecture, you know, addressing many practical challenges in today's world, in contemporary context, I would say, I would say most practical challenges at, of any material size is hard because they exhibit features of complex systems. To address those challenges, we need to go beyond reductive attempts to take things apart into the pieces. Those are absolutely essential, but we need to go beyond, we need to supplement them with, with system science tools. Um, and dynamic modeling provides us these tools to reason about these behaviors of complex systems that builds on the reductive tools, but the results of them, but helps us take them to a greater level, just as a general contractor builds on the results of the specialist contractors in building a house, but knits them together into a complete package. Models express dynamic hypotheses um, 
uh, about you know, the, the processes that underlie what we see from the world. When we see behavior from the world, whether it's that uh, growth of infection curve or those cycles of infection, patterns of, of big disparities um, that we see, um, you know, bursts of, of, um, of uh, you know, uh, mental health distress in communities, et cetera. Um, they help us reason about why we see those by helping us create these systems that can give rise to emergent behavior in the model that lets us test hypotheses that might explain what we see from the world. And models can help us thereby better understand what's going on in the world, why we see certain complex patterns, why we see these persistent troubling patterns, um, and how interventions might affect things. Um, models are specific to purpose, um, just like maps. They are specific to the purpose for which we want to put them. There's no one model of gonorrhea in Saskatoon. There's different models based on what your goals are with that model. Um, multiple and hybrid modeling types are, are complementary um, for describing complex decision-making challenges, but agent-based modeling has a particular role to play in being a flexible, versatile form of modeling that allows us to capture richly different aspects of context, spatial network, relational context, heterogeneity, and, and to capture the stories that occur at an individual level. Um, it allows us to do that in ways that can tap additional sources of data and that can compare against data from the world with data generating by the model. Agent-based models allow us to capture that socio-ecological hierarchy I talked about, where we have people and relationships in neighborhoods or schools and, and, and going out from there, or that complex mosaic of, of interlinked components for the food system, for example. It allows us to capture these rich structures at multiple levels and reason about different behavior at different levels and, and to tell stories at different levels in ways that are, that are very distinctive um, as a technique. Models have strong limitations, but maybe the least bad of the known alternatives for many goals. So agent-based models, ladies and gentlemen, um, play uh, a, a key role as a tool in addressing some of these foremost challenges of our society for the 21st century. And that's why this course is devoted to them. Um, hybrid models weave together additional model types in ways that speak to the unique strengths of those models. Um, our next, our next uh, set of lectures are going to be uh, talking some about getting going on agent-based modeling projects and, and challenges associated with agent-based conceptualization and agent-based formulation. Taking an idea for a model, um, recognizing the features of it that, um, that will allow us to simplify, um, to make it feasible, and then to put it into a form that we can get it towards the point of simulation. And we'll be talking about a set of approaches for doing that and a set of um, heuristics that we can use along the way. I'll be introducing a, a framework, the off-parties framework. I'll be, um, I'll be talking about the threefold division between exogenous, endogenous, ignored, um, but also be talking about um, some components of, of casting our understanding on causal pathways. When we're equipped by that, we will be equipped to then start out and a systematic journey through agent-based modeling more generally on how we build these models up to characterize different types of aspects of these processes. Evolving state, characteristics and, and heterogeneity, network structures, spatial components, mobility, um, placing people um, in interaction with an environment, multi-level modelings, and, and to undertake common processes like sensitivity analysis, um, calibration, et cetera. So that's what lies ahead. Um, 
for coming weeks. Um, thank you for bearing with the technical issues for today. Um, we have a radically different setup and I'll be debugging it, um, but uh, I'll look forward to any feedback people may have um, on um, the, uh, you know, the suitability of the video here and the audio. Um, but thanks for bearing with that. And I will open office hours now and close out the class.